Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us in this conversation around voting rights. My name is Charles Taylor. I'll be moderating the conversation. I'm representing One Voice as a civic engagement consultant, as well as the Mississippi State Conference uh, as the political action chair. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to thank both of the leaders of those organizations. Uh, Robert, uh, I want to thank Robert James, who is the president of the NAACP from Mississippi, as well as Nishambi Lambright Haynes, who is executive director of One Voice. And I want to thank them for, uh, for, for allowing us to have this conversation around voting rights. Today, I'm joined by three exceptional panelists, uh, the attorney Carol Rhodes, who is a civil rights attorney, voting rights attorney, ha has been you know, at the helms of some of the biggest fights, legal fights in the state of Mississippi for the last several decades. So I'm thankful to have him with me, as well as attorney Latoya Thompson, who's a, who's a voting rights attorney and, and leading some, some wonderful efforts in Mississippi to make sure that we can have uh, great election practices and make, make sure that the folks in Mississippi uh, you know, know uh, that we can have a fair election. And then lastly, we have um, Tony Johnson, who's election commissioner from Hines County. And so Tony has been an avid leader in uh, Hines County and throughout the state of Mississippi. I wanna thank her for being here. And so, you know, without further ado, we'll kick off the conversation. I wanna ask a couple questions to Attorney Rhodes. So Attorney Rose, the first question I have for you is, will you tell us a little bit about, you know, history of fighting for voting rights in Mississippi and share a few key moments with the people who are watching uh, on Facebook? Okay. Uh, thank you, Charles, for having me this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here joining you all. And I wanted to start with uh, the 1960s, around 65, 66, 67, uh, after the uh, Voter Rights Act was passed in 1965, uh, there was a uh, big push uh, in 66 and 67 to get uh, African Americans registered to vote in the state. And that push was done through federal registrars and also through the civil rights community. And one of the what led to the Voting Rights Act being passed was the efforts by the uh, NAACP. Aaron Henry was the president, uh, and civil rights organizations and and individuals such as uh, Henry Kirksey, Fannie Lou Hamer, and others who had fought for the right to vote. And they had run mock elections that attempted to run in Democratic um, Party primaries in the between 64 and 65 and 66 but the democratic party at the time was primarily uh all white party and all the elected officials in mississippi were were democrats and so they laid part of the groundwork for why we needed a voting rights act as well as voting rights activists throughout the rest of the south you know including uh the folks in Selma, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, and others who built a record for Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act. So after the Voting Rights Act was passed, and there was a big push to get uh, African Americans resident, registered in Mississippi, and African Americans were registered between 65 and 67. 66, we had uh, congressional elections, and we had uh, African Americans to run primarily as independents because it was hard to run as uh, d Democrats back then. And black voters did uh, vote in record numbers. That scared people in the legislature. That scared the governor and others who saw that blacks could win in a lot of these areas, like in the Delta. And during that time, the population in the Delta was primarily African Americans, but African Americans were just beginning to register to vote, and so the people who ran the legislature and the governor thought, well, we need to change a bunch of different laws, but we're not going to say we're doing it to keep blacks from voting. Uh, they changed and they made at-large districts. They had the majority vote requirement uh, in order to win because if a 
Democrat, a white Democrat won, ran, a white Republican ran, and African American ran as an independent, it would have been easier for that African American to win unless they had a majority vote requirement. They drew unusually large districts. And these were impediments that they had used to uh, keep blacks from voting and from holding office. Civil rights groups brought lawsuits in the uh, mid to late 60s, throughout the 70s, to challenge a bunch of those and what we call were structural barriers. Those were barriers that were put up by legislative action to make it more difficult for blacks to register and to win. They came up with all sorts of little tricks, such as uh, change in uh, polling places at the last minute, uh, making sure polling places were set up in areas that was inaccessible for blacks, putting polling places in uh, areas that were known to be uh, hostile to African Americans, so that to discourage them from from going to the polls, but blacks went in record numbers throughout the sixties, throughout the seventies, throughout the eighties, and they were voting in a way and were successful. We were successful in a bunch of those early lawsuits challenging the structural barriers, striking down uh, the. Uh, at large election system throughout many of the municipalities uh you had aldermen city council people uh who were all elected at large most uh, quite a few cities were uh majority white with sizable black populations and so they had at large they had uh, major they had the uh requirement for everybody to run and be elected at one time rather than having single-member districts. We were successful in challenging single-member districts uh, throughout the cities, successful in challenging the supervisor's districts, justice court judges' district, constable districts. And a lot of the blacks who were elected to office were elected to those local offices. And there were also challenges brought to get blacks elected to the legislature. Uh, You might know that Robert Clark was the first African-American elected to the legislature after the uh, Reconstruction period. And he he was elected from Holmes County, which was overwhelmingly black in 1967. And he was first black until about 1971 after legal action, which led to a few more blacks being being elected to the legislature in 1975. We had a few few more blacks elected to the legislature in 1979. We had a few more blacks elected, and in the 1980s, we had a few more blacks elected. And when I talk about this uh, litigation history of these suits being brought, challenging these structural barriers, It took a long time in court. I think the legislative uh, case, and it was the lawyer's committee, and and Frank Parker from the lawyer's committee was the lawyer who primarily handled it. Uh, When he started, it took 14 years, nine trips to the United States Supreme Court before we could get blacks really elected in the late 1990s and early 1980s. And even then, we only had blacks in the teens and and low 20s who were elected to office. You know, the Mississippi legislature has 174 members, 52 members in the Senate, and 122 in the House. Now, all of this came about, they, they reduced the number of legislatures after the Voting Rights Act was uh, looked like it was going to it was going to pass because it used to have more members of the legislature, but the more members you have, uh, the smaller the districts would have to be. So they the legislature reduced the number of 
of districts in the House, I think from 144 to 122, uh, I think the Senate was reduced. And that meant they drew larger districts and they had to take in more territory. And they would combine black areas with white majority areas so that the white voters could cancel out the black voters. And so you would not get blacks elected, but we did through a series of legal actions over a period of a few decades, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, we were able to get more blacks elected. Now, the Voting Rights Act, and that was a primary tool we were using. Back then, we had two primary tools we used in the Voting Rights Act. Section 5, which, which meant that any change in voting, and it was really in parts of uh, the old Confederacy, primarily in a few parts of, of the northern areas, but all of Mississippi was covered by the Voting Rights Act. Any change in voting had to be either pre-cleared by the United States Attorney General or a federal court in Washington, D.C. And the reason Section 5 was put in place was because of all these schemes the legislature kept coming up with over the years to keep blacks from voting. So when the Voting Rights Act was passed, Congress said we need to put something in there to make it uh, a little bit harder for them to come up with these schemes. And so the Section 5 provision was put in so that they had to get preclearance of any new schemes. We challenged the, within the civil rights community. When I say civil rights community, I mean the NAACP uh, and other local civil rights organizations were challenging a lot of these changes they were making to to voting. Uh, they'd have a re-registration to make every, everybody re-register after a few years, knowing that it was difficult for blacks to get off of work to go register. And they had to go uh, to the courthouse to register. A lot of rural counties that was meant transportation. And we didn't have the transportation to get back and forth. And so they would come up with all sorts of schemes, and we were challenging those schemes, forcing them to go to the Justice Department to get preclearance. And when that didn't work, we challenged them in court. And a lot of times these legislatures and counties would implement changes without even getting preclearance. They didn't want the federal government telling them what to do. And they'd try to implement a change. We had to file suit in court and and get that change blocked because they didn't get it pre-cleared. Now, Section 5 was only in place for five years. Congress saw that Mississippi and these other southern states were still doing so bad on on uh, making voting easier and fairer that Congress extended the Section 5 for another five years. And then uh, it was extended from 1965 to 1970, 1970 to 1975. Then Congress extended it to 1982. And a big change happened in 1982 because Section 2, during all that time, uh, we had to prove in court that the legislatures and counties and cities had an intent to discriminate. They were enacting these new laws with the intention of keeping black folks from voting and keeping them from being elected to office. And intent was hard to prove. So in 1982, we were pretty successful in getting Congress to change that intent standard to a result standard. And all we had to do then was prove that whatever law they put in place concerning voting, the result was it was more difficult for African Americans to either win office or to vote, and it was easier to challenge. And Congress also said, well, we're going to do something about Section 5. And so they had to extend Section 5, five years, five years, and then seven years. Uh, so Congress said, we're going to uh, extend Section 5 for about 20, was it, 
20 years or 25 years from 1982 to 2006. And it was after the 1982 uh, extension of Section 5 and the amendment of Section 2 that we actually were able to go to court in record cases, getting blacks elected to, we had to, we challenged supervisor districts, and they had to draw black majority supervisor districts for the first time uh, to get uh, blacks to have a chance to be elected to office, justice court judges district, constable districts. And after that 1982 amendment to the Voting Rights Act, we filed hundreds of cases throughout Mississippi, challenging uh, different counties, cities, school boards. Uh, we brought a series of challenges to the legislature, challenged the second congressional district, how it was drawn. And uh, we were able to get the second congressional district redrawn where it was slightly majority black. And Mike Espy was finally elected as a congressman in 1986 from the redrawn 2nd Congressional District that we were able to get done after Congress amended the Voting Rights Act in 1982. And then in 1990... The uh, Henry Kirks led the effort, but the NAACP was part of that effort and other civil rights organizations to try to get more blacks elected to the Mississippi legislature. And, and, and Tony Rose, if, if I could add, you know, I think the efforts that they had was uh, out. Uh, I don't even know how the word for it. I would say exceptionally um, uh, wonderful because now Mississippi has more black elected officials than any other state in the country. So, you know, oh, yeah. looking at the data from last year, you know, every single year, every single election cycle from the time that you were talking about, you know, we've had more black elected officials. We've uh, had more black elected and and it used to be the Joint Center for Political Studies out of Washington. We keep track of all the black elected officials throughout the country. Yes, sir. And that's about every time they did a publish the book, saying how many black elected officials Mississippi were had had record numbers. Yes. But to show you what we did in nineteen after the nineteen ninety census, the census come out every ten years. So after every ten years, you have to do a redistricting primarily. This census is 2020. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be published next year, 2021, and we're going to use that to see how many more black majority districts can be drawn in the legislature and in counties and cities as well. Now, between the 1980s and and and, and now, we've been pretty successful in getting. Black majority districts drawn wherever possible. In 1991, uh, when we finally got the case resolved, and, and Hollis Watkins, Doctor Muhammad Hollis Watkins, was the uh, Hollis Watkins Muhammad, excuse me. He was the, uh, the primary litigator in that case, and we doubled the number of blacks in the Mississippi legislature. Well, we're more than double. Because at the time, it was about 25 in the legislature. And we got 52 districts drawn. We got about a third of the entire Mississippi legislature being having black majority districts, and we were able to get blacks elected from all of them. Yes, sir. And, and if and, we talk about those districts now, you know, we have 40 black house members and uh, because of some of the extra redistricting efforts, we have 14 senators. And I wanted to really appreciate the conversation that we've been having. And I know for me being a, a person who's always been an admirer of voting rights and admirer of yours, and also Hollis Watkins, I could have this conversation all day long. Um, but you know, I didn't want to keep our folks too long. And I wanted to 
uh, transition, if you may, to talk to Latoya Thompson, who's an attorney in Mississippi, who's on the ground right now, you know, fighting for these same voting rights efforts, you know, and, and I would say picking up the torch uh, where, you know, a, a lot of you all have, have passed it on to her and others. And so I wanted to ask Latoya, um, can you tell us a little bit about this year, what voting during COVID-19 may look like uh, and what are some rules and regulations that people need to keep in mind? And once again, Attorney Rose, I really want to thank you for sharing that wealth of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Charles. So starting off with voting itself, um, in Mississippi, there are two ways to vote in person on election day or absentee. Um, and in order to vote absentee, there are several um, categories of excuses that you, one of which you must meet um, in Mississippi in order to vote absentee. I, I can go through those briefly or not. You can give me direction on that, Charles. Um, it, it'll be good to kind of talk through a few of those. Okay, okay. So if you're an enlisted um, or commissioned member, if you're in the service, that's one. If you're in the Merchant Marine or American Red Cross, um, disabled war veteran who's a patient in the hospital, um, a civilian serving outside of the United States with the Armed Forces, Merchant Marine, American Red Cross. If you're a citizen temporarily residing outside of the U.S., um, if you're in, in this one, this could be really popular. If you're a student, teacher, or administrator at a college, university, et cetera, whose school or work requires you to be outside the county of your voting residence. Um, if you're 65 years or older, if you um, are a member of a congressional delegation or spouse or dependent, and this could be a popular one, if you are required to be at work on election day during the times which the polls will be open, so from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., if you have to be at work that whole time, you qualify to vote absentee. And last but not least, the one that's really been the issue of change this year is if you have a temporary or permanent physical disability. So FYI, if you fit in any of those categories, please take note that you are able to vote absentee. And if your friends and family fit in those categories, please take note so that you can let them know that they can vote absentee. And I'm gonna tell you about some changes for um, this year with regard to voting absentee. Now the rules for voting absentee did change under Mississippi House Bill 1521 this year, which passed and became effective on July 8th. 2020. There were some temporary changes in there in light of COVID, and there were some permanent changes. I am so happy to say, due to the O'Neill versus Hoseman case, which was litigated by our very own esteemed attorney Carol Rose, who is on the phone, who is on the Facebook Live um, in the Mississippi NAACP. So for this year only, um, who can vote absentee in terms of uh, a temporary change? Well, the category that I mentioned of temporary physical disability includes people who are under a physician imposed quarantine um, due to COVID and persons caring for dependents under a physician imposed quarantine. So temporary physical disability category is not new, but this inclusion to take into account COVID um, and people who will qualify as being under physician imposed quarantine is new. Now there is an ACLU um, lawsuit right now that is going to help perhaps define physician imposed quarantine um, and what that means and who qualifies. Several people are working to attempt to get the broadest um, interpretation possible so that as many people as possible can vote safely um, in light of COVID. Another change that was a temporary change for this year only has to do with when you can vote. So the in-person deadline has uh, been the Saturday before the election, which this year falls on October 31st, Halloween. So don't forget to vote in person absentee by Halloween. Um, normally the deadline for that is at noon this year you have five more hours and you can vote until 5 p.m. at your circuit clerk's office if you are in that list of people who qualify and can vote absentee in person. Now, as I mentioned, there were also some permanent changes that I think would be useful for people to know um, who can qualify to vote absentee. 
in House Bill 1521, um, the mail-in ballot deadline has changed. So now your mail-in ballot must be postmarked on election day on November 3rd. So if you can get it to the post office and I recommend you take it inside of the post office, watch them postmark it, and then you can leave it. Um, but make sure it's postmarked by November 3rd and then it has to be received within five business days. So that's a mail-in ballot deadline change. Um, another change is that your absentee vote is now final. And this could be a big deal for some people. You used to have the opportunity if you submitted an absentee ballot mm -hmm. and you changed your mind or for whatever reason, felt like you needed to vote on election day, you could. But House Bill 1521 has now said your absentee vote is final. That's why we wanna be sure we get it right and get it done on time. Um, another change you can expect is when your absentee vote will be counted. Well, that's going to depend on when it arrives, because it used to have to arrive the day before Election Day. But now, since it has to be postmarked on Election Day and can arrive up to five business days later, um, absentee votes will be counted during that five business day period, which means depending on when your absentee vote gets in, it might not be counted until the next Tuesday, November 10th, or potentially the day after that. Um, but the good news is that now under House Bill 1521, the circuit clerk must provide all absentee voters with written information to inform the voter how to ascertain whether your ballot was rejected and the reason for rejection. So the big takeaways are if you vote absentee in person, you have until Halloween at five o'clock to do so at your circuit clerk's office. They'll be open all that day. And if you vote by mail, please get your ballot postmarked, take it in the post office by election day. So those are the changes. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. I would ask, could you repeat those last two changes just in case someone didn't catch them? Cause I think that was really important. Absolutely. If you fit in one of those categories to vote absentee and you can vote absentee in person in your circuit clerk's office, the deadline is um, Halloween, October 31st, and you have from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. that day. That's the last day, but it starts on September 21st. Um, and then the second change that I mentioned, mail-in ballot deadline. Please get your mail-in ballots postmarked no later than November 3rd, as early as possible if you can, but no later than November 3rd, and then they have to be received five business days later. Uh, thank you so much for that. Those are some crucial changes to talk about. And, and to consider, uh, you know, I'm excited to know that because I, I, I've, I've had friends who have voted absentee in the past and they got gotten there on election day uh, and they were disappointed because their vote was not counted. Yeah. I can just tell you on a personal note, my mother who takes great pride in voting in person uh, is, is somebody who's, who's vulnerable to COVID and because she's in a vulnerable age group. And this is her first uh, time that she's gonna vote by mail and just a few days ago, we were having a conversation as to what that would look like. And so I wanna thank you again, uh, Attorney Latoya Thompson for sharing that with us. And Tony, I just wanted to ask a few questions of you. Uh, as election commissioner uh, in Hines County, can you talk to us about how you all are preparing for this election? What may be different uh, because of COVID? You know, what may be different based on some things that you learned from previous elections? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, we do want to encourage those that fall in those categories um, to vote early. Um, if you're vulnerable, um, maybe working, um, that's always going to help reduce the crowds right now um, for the precinct. Um, so we definitely um, have been working on a method to train our poll managers. Um, we don't want to disenfranchise people, but on the county level, we have provided a PPE um, for those that do want to vote in person. We want you to know that Hines County is prepared. We want you to feel safe when doing so. So we've ordered masks for poll workers as well as voters. Uh, we've ordered some additional voting machines for our heavy precincts so that you can kind of space those lines out. You won't have as many people waiting in line, maybe one or two machines. We plan to put at least three in some of our heavy volume precincts. Uh, we've also hired additional uh, poll workers uh, through one of the house bills that passed uh, with pandemic pay. So we'll have people um, in the precincts that will be sanitizing all throughout the day, making sure that um, social distancing is being enforced. Um, and in some of our larger precincts, we're working on some logistics if the weather permits. Um, some of the voter check-in will be on the outside and you will actually cast the ballot 
on the inside of the precinct to kind of keep people separated. Um, each person um, will have an individual disposable pin. Here in Hines County, we do use the DS200, so we have ballots. Um, and so typically people will rotate the same pin on a traditional year. That won't be the case this year. So everybody will have a disposable pin, will have uh, hand sanitizer, Lysol wipes. Um, the Secretary of State is providing face shields along with the mask that we'll be having. Some of the difficulties we've had, um, I'm a supporter of not relocating precincts unless it's an absolute emergency. We've had to temporarily relocate three of them due to COVID. Um, one of the facilities in Clinton is a senior living facility. So most of those residents are vulnerable and in a certain age group. So we've had to relocate that one to Sumner Hill High School. And we've had two churches that just don't feel comfortable in opening because they're private facilities and letting people in due to COVID. So we put those in fire stations and a school to kind of combine them. Um, we did it early on. And so we're also in the process of sending out notification cards well ahead of time using social media and of course uh, public service announcements to get the word out about that. It's looking different for us because a lot of our seasoned co-workers are in that vulnerable state. So we've had to look at new methods of recruiting uh, college students um, or people that are comfortable working in the polls without having some type of illness or risk of being, um, you know, possibly picking up COVID. So those are some of the challenges we're facing. Um, we have not reached the additional 125 in poll workers we want. We're probably at about 80% right now. So we are still recruiting those people. They'll be trained. And Charles, I want to touch on some things that um, voters have experienced before COVID that were issues that we're trying to hone in on. Um, voter ID, um, not a supporter of the course that passed on the state level. Um, everyone that's coming in the precincts will be required to wear a mask. However, we're telling poll managers, you know, you can't um, ask someone or make them remove their mask in order to say, hey, I want to I wanna see your face. Um, due to the mandate currently going on now with the governor and anyone in Hines County, you're required to wear a mask when you're coming in the precinct. Um, voter ID is strictly to be looking at the person's face, not the address. So we've had in the past people that will complain about managers that will want to compare and contrast the address and we're telling them no, you're strictly to look at their face. So those are some of the things that we are honing in when we get ready to do our training starting September 1 uh, that we want our poll managers to be vigilant about and to be careful to not disenfranchise people. Um, and we're going to try to keep it down to at least 10 people in the precinct at one time. And so we're just asking people to be patient, uh, be prepared. And if you're not comfortable, of course, you can vote absentee. Uh, thank you so much for that, Tony. We have a few questions on Facebook. But before we do, I did want to uh, mention some of the disenfranchising crimes uh, that would uh, allow for someone not to be able to be registered to vote in the state of Mississippi. Uh, when you said that, it made me think about it. And I know this is a very sensitive subject, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to share that list and then a, a quick story as to why I think it's really important. But, um, you know, if you have been convicted of a crime in the state of Mississippi, uh, if you have, have been convicted of only these crimes, uh, uh, um, voter fraud, murder, rape, bribery, theft, arsoning, obtaining money or goods under false pretense, perjury, forgery, embezzlement, bigamy, armed robbery, extortion, felony bad checks, felony shoplifting, larceny, receiving stolen property, robbery, timber larceny, unlawful taking of a motor vehicle, statutory rate, carjacking, or larceny, larceny under lease or rental agreement. Um, the reason why I want to bring that up is because I'll never forget, we were doing voter registration uh, for 2012 election, which we all know was a, a hotbed election, uh, which resulted in President Obama being reelected. We were out in South Jackson, uh, uh, Amber Thomas, uh, who, was, who was an organizer with one voice uh, at the time, we were out in South Jackson and we were just registering folks to vote. And so, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, I'm a convicted felon, I can't register, but that may or may not be the case. It's about those 20 or so crimes that unfortunately you cannot register to vote. 
So there was a lady there who was in her mid fifties and had been convicted of a felony at the age of 19. And so we showed her the list. She breaks down in tears and says, you know, this whole time I've been wanting to register to vote. I've been wanting to vote, but I didn't because I thought I couldn't as a convicted felon. Fortunately for her, she was not convicted of one of those uh, felonies. And so she was excited for the first time uh, that she could vote. It was an African-American uh, man running for president. And so I didn't want to share that story because there, I, I can imagine there are folks out there who, you know, may unfortunately be convicted of a felon only to realize, yes, you may be convicted of a felon, but it's not one of the disenfranchising felonies. And so I think that's really important to note as we register to vote. You know, if, if I had it my way, I believe that if you are a citizen of this country, you should be able to vote in this country. Uh, but with, with me not being the one making those laws, I did want to make sure that we knew what the law is around that. Um, so as we talk about a couple of questions we had in from Facebook, one of them uh, is one that Attorney Thompson has mentioned before. And so I want to feel free for you to uh, uh, re-ask this, re-answer this question. And that is, you know, what about those who are in quarantine in light of COVID-19? You know, what, what are their options yeah. around COVID? Yeah. So people under a quarantine, now I, I suppose at this moment, while we're still waiting on the ultimate determination of, of the meaning of the new law, the new law says those under physician-imposed quarantine due to COVID-19 can vote absentee uh, under the category of temporary physical disability. And, and that, it, it's not good to be in that category, but it's a good category from the perspective of your voting options because you're able to vote absentee in person or in mail. Uh, or by mail. Now, if you're under self-imposed quarantine, um, right now, that's going to be up to your circuit clerk to call and see um, when they are, under what circumstances, they will allow you to vote temporary uh, physical disability. I've heard uh, Tony and her colleagues, as we've been listening in to their election commission meetings, um, be very, very pro-voter and say, if you check temporary physical disability, you know, that it's not our job to investigate that and see exactly why we're going to trust you and you're gonna be able to vote as a person who has temporary physical disability. Oh, but if all, could our, all of our counties um, would be that pro voter. So this is really one of those areas in election law where there's, um, it's not specified and it's really gonna be up to your circuit clerk. So. We pray that you have one that's pro voter and or um, someone that that the NAACP or ourselves or somebody else has been able to to uh, convince that you should be able to absentee. Uh, thank you so much for that. And then we have one other question uh, said from from Facebook, and that is around the the notary process. So uh, I guess it's a two part question. One, can you talk about if you do vote by mail or vote absentee, you know, do you still need a notary in light of COVID-19? And two, uh, if you're low income, do you know of any ways of, of being able to alleviate some of the costs of getting uh, your, your ballot notarized? Okay. So you have to, so let me say an absentee voting in Mississippi is a two-step process. Um, you have to submit a ballot application um, in order to get your ballot. And then you, and you have to, for both of those, you have to fill them out. The ballot application is where you check which absentee excuse you qualify for. Then um, you have to get it witnessed and, and submit it. And you have to do the same thing with the ballot. Um, complete your ballot, get it witnessed and send it in. If you're voting by mail, if you're voting absentee in person, you do that all um, in person. Now, the statute requires uh, what's referred to at points in the statute as an attesting witness. A notary is one of those people, but it's not the only people. There are also um, various postmaster positions that qualify um, to be able to witness your ballot. Now, if you are disabled, if you are temporarily or permanently physically disabled, you can get anyone 18 or over to witness your ballot. The rest of us, though, who happen to qualify to vote absentee, have to get some kind of a testing witness. Like I said, the notary is not the only one. That's probably the one people are most familiar with, but we're, we're certainly working on materials to help people understand who all 
um, they can get to sign that. And hopefully your circuit clerk and your election commission would also help you with that information. Um, and Charles, everyone should know that they can search on the Secretary of State's website for all notaries. You can search by your city and you can see who all in your city um, is a notary. If that is the kind of witness that you want to attest to your application or to your ballot and not all of those people um, charge a fee. So being able to see everybody in your city, you can literally call down the list and see who will not charge you um, and, then, and then get that, that person's service if the fee is going to be prohibitive. Attorney Thompson, can I chime in quickly? And, and that the last week, I've had a lot of conversations around what qualifies as a witness or a notary. And so that may be something that um, maybe we can look at putting together um, because the question has been, well, if I'm over 65, do I have to have a notary? Or if I'm a student, can I get somebody to witness? So what legally is the correct answer? Or does everyone need to get a notary? Or does everyone need to just have a witness sign it? So those are the conversations yeah. I think um, that the community is trying to narrow down. So any insight on that would be helpful that I could take and pass along as well. Yes. So, so the statute says um, any notary public, United States postmaster, assistant United States postmaster, United States postal supervisor, clerk in charge of a contract postal station or other officer having authority to administer an oath or taking acknowledgement may be an attesting witness. And, and people with authority to administer an oath, I believe even goes beyond the list that I just read in that statute. That's actually one of the things Attorney Rhodes has gone that they asked for that statute to be broadened. So it would list all the people who have authority to administer an oath. So it's not a secret and it's not a hardship for people to figure out who can sign my ballot. Um, so that is definitely something that we, we need to, yes. to Mr. Johnson have an educational campaign around that. So that's not a mystery for people to figure out who can witness my ballot. And then if you're temporarily or permanently physically disabled, anybody 18 years and older can sign your ballot and you're good to go. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank, thank you all so much for this conversation. Like I said, I really appreciate Attorney Rose who, who had to leave us, also Attorney Thompson, as well as Election Commissioner uh, Johnson. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. I know we could talk about this issue for hours. Uh, mm -hmm. Before we go, I just wanted to thank both of you all for sharing this information. This is extremely important, especially with this election. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing at One Voice and NAACP as it relates to the Civic Engagement Roundtable. And so uh, One Voice and the NAACP has hosted an election protection hotline or election protection um, program for over a decade. Uh, as you see on the screen, if you have any issues, feel free to call 1-888-601-VOTE. Um, and one of the questions about it being a notary, if you are uh, wanna, wanna have a notar someone to notarize your ballot, you can contact us at One Voice. You can call that election protection hotline once again, it's one 601 vote and we'll connect you with someone. Um, like I said, Attorney Rose, if he was still with us, could share uh, that he, along with a panel of attorneys, like I said, have been working with the election protection when there's been issues uh, at the polling locations. And we also had a host of volunteers who were willing to go to polling locations to figure things out, you know, they're uh, across the state of Mississippi. Uh, and we just wanted to uplift those efforts and know that we'll be in full effect doing it um, at this year, especially with this election being so important and things uh, being very sensitive as it relates to COVID-19. Um, for folks who want to join the Civic Engagement Roundtable at One Voice and at NAACP, uh, feel free to reach out to us at that same number. You know, we are always looking for volunteers, uh, folks who want to make phone calls, to, to just make GOTV get out the vote phone calls, text messages, et cetera, and people who want to volunteer on election day to figure some things out. Um, you could also visit onevoicems.org forward slash resources to find out more information about voting. Once again, I want to thank you all for being here with us. Um, this conversation could not have been as fruitful if it wasn't for you all being here. And I want to thank you for the work that you do 
um, you know, as, as a Mississippian, it makes me proud. And I'm just excited for November 3rd and beyond. So once again, thank you. And thank you for everybody for joining us on Facebook. One more thing, Charles, before we go. Um, oh, absent absentee starts September 21st through uh, October 31st. Um, okay. So you can call and request those ballots or come in on those dates. And the last day to be um, to get registered to vote for the November election is October the 5th. All so right, and repeat, can you repeat that one more time? So the voter registration deadline for the November's election is October the 5th. And the absentee voting starts 45 days before each election, and that date is September 21st, and it goes through October 31st at 5 p.m. Right. Well, thank you so much, and thank everybody once again. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.